Can I just thank the President and the uh, um, committee for being brave enough to ask me to do this? The reason I'm saying that, of course, is that um, I basically, at the end of my career, I can say what I like. <laughs> I'm never going to get another merit award. I mean, the worst thing they can do is sack me, and they're probably going to sack me anyway. So, um, you know, so all it means is I just spend a bit more time in my garden. Okay. Um, I mean, said that. I don't have any declarations. Nobody's interested in anything I say anymore. So, a big thank you. Um, can I thank all those speakers who actually provided uh, a slide um, or slides for their work? However, I do have a small problem. When the email went out, it did ask for two to three slides, and a significant number of speakers sent 20 to 30 slides, which makes me worried about the numeracy of members of the British Nuclear Medicine Society. So, um, a, a significant number of those people who sent 20 slides were physicists, which really is very worrying. But um, thank you very much. I did manage to do a bit of editing. Um, now, I also understand that quite a lot of speakers didn't really send slides. I know there's, there's many reasons for that. Obviously, some of you are very shy, and you don't want me mentioning you in public and that kind of stuff. I understand that. Now, I know some of you, for example, are talking on maybe this afternoon or Tuesday or Wednesday, haven't actually made any slides yet. So that could be reason two. Reason two. Now, the third reason is probably the one that's, that's most common, is the fact you're still waiting for that last bit of data uh, that you haven't actually quite got yet that's actually in the abstract. So uh, I understand why I didn't get the slides for those as well. So let's move on. So there are 28 um, scientific clinical presentations, oral presentations, and they're spread over the three days of the meeting. So if you want to go to all of them, you have to turn up for all three days. Uh, never mind. Um, now, there are areas which are very innovative, and there are areas which are talking about standard practice. Now, the biggest proportion, not unsurprisingly, is FTG PET, PET CT. That's probably where most people are involved in. Um, but there is a very strong, this year, general nuclear medicine trend. And general nuclear medicine has sort of been a bit forgotten, but it's come forward a bit more this year, which I'm very pleased about. So you can see the division there, and um, suitably small writings. So you can't really read it. But you can see about 40% of these are PET, of which the majority of PET is FDG. But again, increasing number of papers presenting non-FDG PET. So... The youngest city in Northern Ireland is the city of Bangor, not to be confused with the city of the same name in Wales. You think somebody would like work that one out and try and have some kind of difference between the two. Um, now, this was actually, though it is Northern Ireland's youngest city, it is in fact one of their oldest towns. It was actually founded in the sixth century. And it's actually an interesting little um, city to go to. You can go there on the railway, not join the scientific sessions, and it's not worth going when it's raining. Um, but you can get some very good fish and chips there. So the Young Investigators Prize, I think, is the gem of our society meeting because here we meet our future. And there's some very nice talks which have got a clinical bent. This is one looking at the... Um, uptake in the primary lung cancer and trying to see whether or not there is a relationship between what's happening in the lungs and what's happening when we see this gut uptake. Now we often see this diffuse gut uptake. What does it mean? Has it got any kind of prognostic signs? So this is a, a very nice paper from um, Aberdeen, which is in Scotland, not too far away. And what they've done is they've looked at different kinds of cancers, and they didn't really find any correlation between the uptake in the gut and uh, patient survival. But there were some, as you'd expect, some relationships. Um, gender didn't matter. Obviously, diabetes, particularly those obviously treated with metformin, had an uptake. Um, age had an effect on gut uptake, and BMI had an, up to, uh, an effect on gut uptake. So but the only thing that didn't really was the primary tumour. So it may be telling us more about the patient than it's telling us about the cancer. Another uh, paper, now some of these papers are sort of joint sort of physics and clinical or joint technical and clinical. So I'm talking about the clinical aspects of those papers. Other talk speakers might have the same papers but talk about different aspects. So this is thing called the Herder score. For those who don't know the Herder score, it's where you try to use the uptake of glucose in a um, pulmonary nodule to determine whether or not it's malignant or not. Um, not something that I'm desperately a fan of, but it's quite an interesting little paper. And this is in the paper from Imperial, 
And what they're doing here is using different kind of reconstruction techniques to see how that may affect, for example, the SUV and how you might read it if you're using the Herder score. And you can see here a series of different reconstructions, and you can see that the, the little uh, lung tumour becomes more obvious depending on what kind of reconstruction you use. And actually, if you do the calculation, you can actually see that the SUV can change quite significantly. And if you're mad enough to believe that an SUV of two is the borderline between cancer or non-cancer, you can see the type of reconstruction here will determine whether or not uh, a particular lesion you read as malignant or benign. Another paper which is really more scientific but has a, um, a good clinical uh, input is this very nice um, paper looking at neural network approach. Now, one of the things, as you know, the BNMS does support single sample GFRs, but it doesn't work very well in low clearance. But how do you work out low clearance uh, without the GFR? And so uh, people have looked at how you can do this, looking at a series of factors. And what they've done is this is from the University Hospitals uh, Leicester is that they've um, looked at using the normal standard methods of the uh, me measurements of um, chronic kidney failure versus a neural network learning system. And they've looked at a database of over 800 patients, and which is the better predictor of actual um, GFR versus what you think the GFR should be. And here you can see that if you're using the uh, orange dots are those which are done using sort of clinical criteria, and the blue dots are the ones using neural networks. Now, it's not perfect, but it is much better. And I think this is the kind of place where we should be starting to use AI and this kind of idea in improving what we do in nuclear medicine. So I think this is a very exciting paper. So who are the stars of the BNMS nuclear medicine meeting? Well, it's those that actually work in their own departments, in either university departments or clinical departments, who do some work, do some research, and then they're brave enough to write an abstract and brave enough to come here and present it. So what have we got in terms of our stars? Now, anybody who doesn't know who these four people, or five people? Yeah, five people are need to watch Derry Girls, which is probably one of the funniest programs ever made on television. So uh, we've had a nice paper here, which comes from the Wellington, and this is all about um, compassionate use of PSMA therapy. Now, unfortunately, for somebody who is so obsessed with radiocline therapy, sadly, there are very few therapy papers. But this is actually a very nice review uh, that comes from a group of very famous uh, medics, including Professor Lewington and Amy Eccles and various other people, looking at how they uh, provided a service of a lutetium PSMA um, over a period of around about five years. And that included the time over COVID, of course. Now, there wasn't a vast number of patients uh, referred because obviously the difficulty of funding, et cetera, but they did manage to treat 27 patients. Notice not every patient referred was treated, and they managed to get a reasonable amount of doses in. And um, only two of those 27 patients over that period have died, which I think is actually quite interesting because all these patients are pretty well end of life. So it does suggest that this treatment might be changing the natural history of the disease. And for those of you who are interested... Um, the uh, Novartis sold $993 million of lutetium PSMA last year. That's quite a lot. So if you think there's money in PET, there's a lot more money in therapy. Uh, this study, I think, will also appear in some of the other people's highlights, but I thought it was a very interesting one looking at uh, what do we do with patients who are built a little bit more like me? Um, and how do we get a better bone scan? And the answer is probably sodium fluoride. In fact, if you remember back to the days when we had no generators, we uh, had to use sodium fluoride. And when we went back to bone scanning with MDP, all the clinicians said, can I have a sodium fluoride pet, please? And said, no, there's no money. Um, so here they um, looked at um, patients who were a little bit chubbier, the high BMI, and the problem is, as you know, you often get rather poor quality bone scan, but you get very nice quality sodium fluoride. And if I could do sodium fluoride on everybody, I would do sodium fluoride on everybody. But remember, of course, that increased sensitivity always means reduced specificity, so you have to be better in your reporting. 
Uh, this is a detection, uh, this is a study from France, from uh, Jean-Nel Talbert, um, a very famous French nuclear medicine professor. And he's been looking at patients with parathyroid tumors, but not the ones with very high parathyroid levels, but ones which are at the upper limit of normal, but still have the symptoms of hyperparathyroidism. We know that there is a crossover on the uh, biochemistry between normal and abnormal. So some abnormals can have a normal blood test. And uh, he's been looking particularly at the use of choline PET. And whilst choline PET is, pr is, we know, is extremely good in patients who have got a raised parathormone, uh, the sensitivity is very high. It is lower in those who have a normal parathormone, but the symptoms of hyperparathyroidism, but it's still not bad, about 46%. And the reason being is that the smaller the tumor, the less the output of parathormone. So uh, we would love pet, choline PET to be more widely available across the UK for parathyroid imaging. And we're hoping that the funders will actually get around to funding it. But this is very interesting additional data of how we can push those barriers of nuclear medicine. And here we have one of his cases. In this particular case, you can see there's a very small lesion, which is very fortunately has arrowed for us, which is sitting just behind the right lobe of the thyroid, which you can see on the choline pet. Uh, another group here um, has done an, or this is from um, Darby and Burton. They've looked at an audit of Sestamibi spec CT imaging characteristics, now not in parathyroids this time, but there's an interesting in, and increasingly important literature also um, uh, started off by Sabina and her group down in Brighton about the use of this in oncocytomas and tumors in the kidney. So uh, MIBI, which we think of as a cardiac agent or possibly parathyroid agent, is also once called poor man's FDG. But it, because the problems you have with FDG in the kidney maybe might actually have an advantage. And you can see again, fortunately in this study, the very nice big arrow points you to a, a solid lesion uh, in that left kidney, and that is a, a real tumor. So always remember that nuclear medicine is always finding new things to do. And you may think that single photon is dead, and it isn't. There's lots of things you can do with SPECT and SPECT-CT. Um, here we have uh, bone scanning. So again, bone scanning, oh, it's just boring, it's only for cancer. Well, there's lots of things we can do with bone scanning. In fact, a, I would say a good nuclear medicine department does at least 50% of their bone scans for non-oncological reasons, and spec -CT is incredibly useful for that. This is uh, an unusual but useful indication uh, from Manchester, and this is looking at condylar hyperplasia, which is basically when one side of your jaw grows more than the other. And you can't really do corrective surgery until the active process is finished, sometime in the mid to late 20s. And the best way to do that is to look at a bone scan. And here you can see this is the bone scan. And what they're doing is they're quantifying the uptake of MTP between the two condyles to see which one is the most active. And uh, you can see from the CT that this person's got a slightly bent jaw, and that's because of the growth on one side. Once that growth is finished and everything is normalized, then the surgeons can go in and do corrective surgery because it won't regrow. Brain imaging, well, everybody likes brain imaging. Of course, this is degenerative brain disease, and as you know, that's my next part of my uh, personal uh, life as I go to the degenerative brain disease section of my life. Some people may say I've actually got there already, but um, uh, maybe just on the way, shall we say. Uh, and this is looking at DAT scan or IO flu pain, uh, imaging on the, the, one of these brand new fancy pants CZT cameras that GE have made. There's a couple of companies that have got them. And of course, the big advantage is that you will have improved sensitivity. Now, we were told these could only really be used for technician, but ID123 is not too far away in terms of its energy. And this is just pushing that camera a little bit further so that we can have a wider range of studies to do. And this is a very useful study. Uh, we are doing, everywhere I've worked, we do multiples of these every week. Um, and here we have the um, two different kinds of cameras that can be done, the star guide with multiple heads and a standard gamma camera. And um, these are the images that you can get. And you can see very nicely the uh, improved resolution with the star guide. And remember also, you then have all your um, software, which enables you to do things like uh, correct for scatter, and helps you also to do quantification, so you can actually do SUVs, et cetera. So uh, all these new technologies are reinvigorating 
uh, general nuclear medicine as well as PET-CT. We can actually learn from one technique and transfer it to another. So the final section, I'm going to talk about the giants of nuclear medicine. Uh, and there are many innovations in nuclear medicine presented by invited speakers. And over the next three days, you will have too many to, talk, to listen to. But fortunately, I think we can go and listen to them online later. But there's a whole set of new things coming through. I keep being told that nuclear medicine's dying, it's dead, nothing's interesting. That has never been true, and it's certainly less true now than it has been for a generation. You are the luckiest generation in nuclear medicine probably since the 70s, because you are going to see so many innovations in both imaging and therapy. Innovations how we image, innovations with the pharmaceuticals we image with. So some of these we're going to have talks about. And there are new diagnostics and therapeutics, for example, zirconium for PET, looking at different biomolecules, actinium-225 for therapy, and new imaging techniques. So before we start to do that, we have to remember that patients aren't objects. Okay, they're not phantoms. And when we're talking about personalized medicine, it's important to remember the person in the personalized medicine. So I'm looking forward to this talk, which will be talking about people who are non-binary and how they cope with disease and how we can help them to cope with disease. So I think these are very vital talks and I'm very pleased that the scientific committee have arranged for us to learn more about the person behind a disease and not just the disease. And this is another talk from UCLH and this is talking about what happens to people after they have chemotherapy, something called brain fog. Now the question is, does that happen after MRT? And if it doesn't, is that another advantage of MRT? The problem is, when it comes to side effects of treatment, you don't know what they are unless you ask the right questions. And we're very bad as doctors of asking questions. We just assume our patients are okay unless they complain, and that is not appropriate. So again, two very interesting and very good talks. I am looking forward to both of those. AI. Well, AI will be here. AI is coming here. AI is already here. If you use your iPhone to take a picture today, you're using AI. Okay? If you, everything you say, if you use um, um, your computer to look at a SPET CT or a PET CT image, I can bet using the degree of AI, and that will get increased. The thing is that to realize that it's not a threat, it's a tool. And I think that this should again be a very good talk that will help us to understand how that tool will make what we do better, which is what we should be doing. Total body pet. Total body pet is maybe not for every department, but there are many departments that will benefit from this uh, as a research tool and they will be primarily in big, maybe university hospitals. But also, you can get a sort of half total body PET. And I happen to know that one of the next speakers has got one of those just installed in their hospital in London, and able to do more or different things with this. And one of the interesting, exciting parts, this is from Dr. Sam Terry, who um, is working at King's and at the hospitals related to King's. But also we have this very interesting talk. Now I think this slide is going to be used by lots of people. But you can see dynamic PET. This is a three-dimensional image. Dynamic PET. But also you can see, you can do things like breath hold PET. So the sensitivity of these machines is something that we've never had before. So not only may we be able to improve resolution, but we can improve sensitivity. We can image carbon-11 out to two or three days. So that means any drug that contains carbon, we can monitor for two or three days. So these can become essential tools for drug development, for example. So that's why I'm saying you are the luckiest generation in nuclear medicine I think there's ever been, because you are going to have the most powerful and innovative tools in your hands that people have, could only dream of when you're as old as me. Um, now, I can never remember the name of this company. I was told it's not Telex, because that's something that comes down through the telephone. It's Telex, I think. This is a, a paper from Thomas Wagner at Royal Free. And here we're looking at one of these new radiopharmaceuticals with zirconium, which is a long-lived positron emitter. And here we have an antibody which has been used to detect renal cell carcinoma. And for those of you who aren't too sure what that is, if you look, if you ignore the gut uptake, look at the right of the kidney, that is a red blob. That is actually where the, the tumor is. 
Finally, therapy. I don't know why I put therapy at the end. I should put it at the beginning. So, again, radionuclide therapy is something which is going to be really big. And if your department's not doing radionuclide therapy, it needs to be involved in radionuclide therapy. Novartis, since January the 1st, has invested just over two billion US dollars in new radionuclide therapy companies and products. Some of these haven't even got to phase one yet. If Novartis, which, are, uh, which is run by really hard-headed business people, believe this is the future, then this will be the future. So if you're not involved, you need to get involved. At whatever stage, you might be working with your clinical oncologist, you might be doing it with your nuclear medicine physicians. It doesn't matter. This is the future, and they all need imaging. Okay, for personalized medicine. So this is uh, a presentation which will be done by my academic boss, Mike Sotege from Pretoria, and he'll be talking about new aspects in um, radionuclide therapy. Now, the South African government, it is not the richest government on the planet, has invested 36 million pounds in building a new research facility in his hospital to develop new molecular radiotherapy agents because they believe that is the future. So, in the, so when they, our government says they don't have any money, they're talking completely rubbish, because the future is MRT. And if South Africa can invest, then we can invest as well. And for that, I'm going to finish. So I wish you all a Titanic meeting. <laughs> Just don't sing.